Good morning, and uh, a warm welcome to all the participants to the UCAM's Breakfast for Women. And uh, as a chair of the task group of inclusion and diversity, I would first of all uh, thank the organization of UCAM's for the support they have given to this uh, uh, to the organization of this event that is in the framework of the global event created by IUPAC, the Breakfast for Women. Uh, the, the IUPAC wanted in this way to put around a virtual or real cup of coffee women, and I hope really not only uh, women, that want to discuss and uh, take uh, some uh, decision uh, or uh, find some solution to the problem of uh, uh, equal opportunities for women in general and in particular uh, uh, mode for uh, women in science. Uh, this is not actually the first breakfast for women that uh, this group and new camps have been prepared has in 20 in 2021 we organized the first UCAM breakfast for women that was focused on the problems for women related to the covid-19 pandemic then the the year after on 2022 the focus of the breakfast was related to the senior position of women, top position of women in science, in STEM, in academia and the science, but on, uh, not only there. The topic that we have chosen this year is a sensible, a sensible topic as we took this decision, uh, realizing that we are living a tough moment during this year. And uh, these moments are related with uh, a number, a huge number of conflicts in all the world. And uh, we have back in Europe a ghost that we thought was relegated to a, a dark past that is the world. In addition, in other parts of the world, as in Iran, uh, women are really fighting every day for their freedom and uh, also for the right to education and to find uh, a job. So uh, we decided to, uh, to choose this, uh, this topic to uh, try to understand what women do in this context. Of course, we know that uh, the women are the first victim of the war. And uh, also uh, female scientists uh, very often are forced to leave their job and uh, to leave their countries. But uh, today, our guest are dealing with uh, the war, uh, facing the war every day of the, their life from other position, uh, working in uh, international organization uh, like the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapon or in the laboratory of the defense. And uh, from uh, that point of view, we will know uh, how difficult it is to work in this kind of organization for women, uh, what are the, the goal of this organization? And if for a chemist, uh, there are really a female uh, uh, women, it's, uh, uh, it's easy uh, to find uh, real opportunities uh, to work as a chemist in favor of uh, peace and security in this kind of organization. This uh, webinar will be an open uh, webinar. We, uh, uh, Pilar Goya, that was the previous president of uh, uh, EUCAMS, will coordinate the Q and R part of the webinar. We already collected some uh, questions, but please keep 
going in uh, other uh, in uh, uh, writing other questions. So if we we will have time, the our uh, panelists will uh, uh, give their answer at the end of the webinar. But now, before to start the conversation with our panelists, I would like to give the floor to Flores, the president of EUCAMS, uh, to address the, a welcome to the participants of this web, uh, webinar. Please, Flores. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Angela. It's an honor for me to uh, um, briefly say a few words about EUCAMS. Uh, um, for this audience. So um, um, after IUPAC initiated the, the Global Women's Breakfast, I'm really proud that UCAMS has its own um, women's breakfast with each year very interesting and relevant and important topics like today. And I think that also uh, that is also very much appreciated as we have, uh, again, a record number of, of participants. So thank you very much for joining and i'm looking forward to the lectures but also to the to the discussions that uh, that will follow uh, afterwards and um, to say a few more things about uh, about ucams uh, so ucams doesn't have individual members but it has um, uh, 50 organizations as members all across europe and so 50 chemical societies and in this way, UCAMS represents uh, more than 120,000 chemists from all over Europe. And um, of course, in the activities that we are organizing, we don't want to duplicate um, things that the member societies are doing, but we try to be of ad added value and um, have a sort of complementary role, which pretty much uh, are overarching things um, um, in Europe. So. Um, uh, policy is an important topic to uh, to UCAMS, so we participate in um, in discussions at the European level. Uh, we are part of organisations or committees that advise to the European Commission, and we um, try to um, uh, provide a unified voice uh, on behalf of all the chemists in uh, the euro. Um, we have also um, close to 20 divisions, working parties that organize um, also events, more specialized events than, than, um, than UCAMS itself. And um, that makes that uh, over the past few years, uh, we have hundreds of events that eventually are directly organized or uh, endorsed by, uh, by UCAMS. There are also some awards that we hand out on a, on a regular basis. And so there are many activities going on. What I also would like to add is that uh, fairly recently, uh, we, have, we have some news channels, we have newsletters. Um, one was called Chemistry in Europe, the other one, uh, Brussels News Updates. Um, I think very useful and very valuable newsletters, but um, not directly associated with UCAMS. And we have restyled those newsletters, um, we have sort of merged them. And as of January this year, um, there is a new one that is called UCAMS magazine that, um, that is directly associated with UCAMS. And well, um, um, we'll tell you all about what is going on at the, at the European level and keep you up to date of uh, UCAMS activities. So if you don't sus subscribe let, yet, um, please feel free to, uh, um, uh, Google UCAMS magazine and uh, enroll you uh, as a as a subscriber. Um, it's also that I would like to emphasize, especially on this uh, morning of the Global Women's Breakfast, that in all the activities that we are pursuing, um, um, uh, diversity is important to us, inclusion is is important to us, and also um, a, a, a proper balance in gender. So this is something that we always um, keep in mind and um, so in the things that we organize as UCAMS, um, we, 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 well, we uh, try to have and usually that works um, a good balance in gender and a, and a good um, diverse and inclusive uh, speakers for example when it is about a conference or a committee if something needs to be organized 
um, things like this. So that is really a point of attention. And that is also why I'm very proud that we have this, uh, this global women's breakfast. Um, what I uh, should not forget is uh, to close with is to, to thank in particular Pilar and Ineta for, uh, um, uh, for hosting and organize, uh, organizing this event and, and, and Angela uh, for, uh, for uh, introducing everything and um, well eventually also taking over from me as a, as a president in, in, in one year time. Um, having said that, I, um, I would like to give the floor back to, uh, uh, to Angela to, uh, to continue with the program. Okay, thank you very much, Lois. Then uh, it's time to start the conversation with uh, our speaker. And uh, I would like to uh, introduce the first of them, that is uh, Jaime Sue Martinez. She is a member of the scientific board of the OPCW, the organization Pro for prohibition of chemical weapons. And she is also a faculty member of uh, uh, Institute of Ch Chemistry, uh, University of Philippines under the, the chemical physics division. She will uh, talk on chemical safety and security education and knowledge. Please, I made the floor is yes. Hello, good morning, everyone. And greetings to the rest of the world. Good morning to Europe and greetings to the rest of the world. So first, I would like to thank you, Kems, for this opportunity to talk about the work that we are doing in my university on chemical safety and security, education and outreach. This is the outline of my presentation. This is the overview. So it will give you an idea of how my presentation will go. First, I will start with the introduction followed by um, the chemical safety and security course that we have developed for our graduate students. And then I will also talk about the type of mentoring that we do in my lab. Some various types of outreach and dissemination work and of course, the aspiration of our university to develop a center for excellence in CBRNE. I always begin my presentation with the OPCW Associate Program because I felt that this is my enlightenment phase. This is a really great program for young chemical professionals to learn about the Chemical Weapons Convention, the role of the OPCW, and of course, chemical safety and security. It's also a great venue for like-minded individuals to congregate together so they can network, bond, and inspire each other to contribute to this type of work. I strongly believe in the importance of chemical ethics in, um, in preventing the misuse of chemicals as a form of um, a protection layer and this can be done through education and outreach of our young professionals. This is particularly important in developing countries like mine, where physical barriers can be an economic challenge. For instance, in the University of the Philippines where I teach, we have several, um, we have eight constituent universities scattered all over the archipelago, which means that we have several um, chemistry departments, and as far as I know, we have the highest number of types of chemicals that we use for research, analysis, and other applications. Just to show you, this is the National Science Complex of the University of the Philippines, Diliman, just one campus. And right here in the shape of benzene rings are our buildings for chemistry. So that's the Institute of Chemistry. And as far as we know, we're aware of this, right, that the southern part of the Philippines, which is the island of Mindanao, this is the island where I was raised, where I was born and I came from, there is a lot or several um, security challenges. It's beset with these conflicts, which defines the need really to develop a chemical conscience in our young professionals. 
not only to address um, the misuse of chemicals in actual conflicts, but also to prepare them when they are faced with moral conflicts or dilemmas, when it's time for them to perform their own research work. So now I want to talk to you about the chemical safety and security course, which we have developed for our graduate students in the Institute of Chemistry. This is a special topics course called M359. And I have images here of my students on the very first run of the course. We have already implemented this semestral long course twice. And as you can see here, we get very good feedback. So highest is one and lowest is five. And in the last two classes that we have implemented, we get very good um, uh, evaluation of the course as well as that of the teacher. This is the overall objective, of course, of the course, which is to provide an introductory course on chemical safety and security to our graduate students. And it's specifically to tailor to those who are about to perform their thesis or actual research work, as well as for the young chemical professionals or chemists working in government and other chemists aspiring for higher degrees in the future, aspiring to take PhDs, for example. And these are the detailed objectives. We want to instill awareness regarding chemical ethics and the dual use of chemistry in our students, inculcate, of course, the culture of chem chemical safety and security. We also teach them basic risk assessment. As of this point, we don't have an expert yet on risk assessment, so we only follow modules provided for us. And then we also talk about the Chemical Weapons Convention, the OPCW, and existing national-based monitoring bodies that we have in the country, which I have shown here. For example, of course, our national authority. So let me just um, tell you about what we teach our, our students, particularly on the ethics part. So we begin with a duality of chemistry as a field. We talk to them about this. In a way, um, chemistry is an oxymoron in itself, two contrasting concepts in the same um, in the same field. So chemistry is both pure and applied. It's both theoretical and practical. It's also science and technology. And then chemistry is philosophy as well as craft traditions. And chemists can be um, discoverers of knowledge, but also creators of substances. And chemists deal with the size of matter molecules, which affects us living organisms the most. So not the subatomic particles, or the very small and not the very large. This is a cosmos with molecules that can readily cure or kill us. And then we talk to them about the chemist code of conduct, the chemist creed, and there are several, of course. This is just one example from the American Chemical Society. And we talk to them about their responsibility towards the public, the science of chemistry, the profession itself, their employer, their employees, the students, and then associates in the lab, clients, and more importantly, the environment that chemists should understand and anticipate, anticipate the environmental consequences of their work. And these are just identified failures of ethics in chemistry that we teach our students that would be to ignore the relevant works already published on a particular topic, fraudulent results, plagiarism, improper assignment of authorship, conflicts of interest in the following activities. And of course, the worst would be to participate in experiments that lead to weapons of war of any nature, whether chemical, nuclear, or biological. Just to show, show you a slide that we use to teach our, chemist, our young students on the use of and misuse of chemistry. And so for example, this is a slide that we have on triethanolamine, which is uh, a component of things that we use daily in life. So it's being used as emulsifiers, surfactant, and all these other applications. But at the same time, it can also be, um, uh, it can also be a chemical weapon. It can be uh, converted to a chemical weapon and they have to be aware of this. And these are the examples of expected outputs that we have for our students. So for example, for the dual use of chemistry, you ask them to submit a report. And these are the questions that we ask from them. What's the history of the compound? How is it extracted or synthesized? What are the applications? 
when was it used unethically what are the reactions of it use and all these other uh, questions that we ask and then we also asked them to provide a report on chemical compound risk assessment, such as transport, um, storage management, and heat up. And we used the modules provided by the chemical security program of the Sandia National Lab. And this has really helped us a lot in showing to our students how risk assessment is done and how um, chemical safety and security is being implemented. And then we also Talk about the conventions. These are just the different articles that we talk about, about Article 2, Article 10, Article 11. And then more importantly, this is the most important part, which is the last part of the course. We talk about the compliance of the Philippines to the Chemical Weapons Convention. So this is what's really good about the classroom. It's a safe environment. We practice academic freedom so our students can voice out what they think. They can be critical of how things are implemented in terms of chemical safety and security in the country. And so we talk about occupational safety and health in the Philippines, industrial plants in the Philippines, and their compliance with the CWC, and um, case studies of plant accidents and disasters happening in the country in the past two years. And um, these are our future plans. We would like to develop a virtual or hybrid course for this because now with the help of virtual platforms, we can actually invite, readily invite experts um, in, the, in the field of CSS. And so they can be a part of our course. And right now we are working on our memorandum of agreement with the University of Wuppertal is still with our legal department on possibly creating a COIL, which is collaborative online international learning for chemical safety and security. And so that's for our um, special topics course in the University of the Philippines. And now let me talk about um, the type of mentoring that we actually do in my group. And I think that nothing speaks of peaceful use of chemistry as aligning your research work to the SDGs, to the UN SDGs. And so this is what we do in my lab. And so our lab is called the Surface Science Spectroscopy and Laser Lab. And these are my students. And these are the different research work that they're doing. And um, how they're actually con contributing to the different SDGs. As we all know, we have a deadline in 2050. So we are all actually pressed for time. So for example, Carl is working on ionic liquids for carbon capture, which has, um, which has a contribution to Climate Action 13. And then we have with Joshua and May and Alan are working on um, second harmonic imaging of sea cucumber collagen tissue. And this is for SDG 14. And then we also have Enrico who's working on um, safety and recently published his paper. And then just um, some outreach and dissemination work that, um, that we do in the university. So it doesn't have to be really a very grand um, activity. It can be very simple, such as an artwork. And this can be done at the elementary school or secondary school level in terms of peaceful use of chemistry awareness. But this particular artwork was actually created by my fellow um, associate program um, uh, uh, members or uh, alumni. And we created a artwork from um, origami cranes. We put it together and we actually gifted it to the Hiroshima Museum for Peace. And so this, this can be also done by other groups. And these are just various activities that we do. For example, we have here a poster making contest for elementary school students on the peaceful use of chemistry, their interpretation of it anyway. And then we have guesting on chemical safety and security in the media and in the radio. Um, I also participate in technical working groups pertaining to the Chemical Weapons Convention in my country, as well as participation in a technical committee on nanotechnologies, which is um, an initiative by our Department of Trade and Industry and Department of Science and Technology, because at this point, we still don't have policy on how to approach nano safety. 
And of course, I'm, I'm a member of the SAB, and this is also part of my extension work in the university. And so uh, we present in various um, conferences and seminars on this particular topic on the peaceful use of chemistry, as well as chemical safety and security. And I have enlarged those that were presented recently. And I think I've started doing this since 2016. And also publications are, of course, a very good way to disseminate. This is one of our papers back in 2018 with Professor Reniers. Um, from, the, from Delft University. And my role in the paper really is about the role of education and ethics in terms of chemical plant and safety. And then during my associate program, which I, which I have told you earlier, is really very enlightening for me. I was um, sent to Japan in the Mitsushima Gas Company for my um, industry segment. And there I have learned about chemical safety and security for more or less a month. And what really struck me was this, the, the need for maintenance in the industry to keep it safe and so that the communities around it will not be harmed. So this inspired me to come up with my own corrosion studies after all these trainings that were done on um, material fatigue. And so we tried our ionic liquids to see if they can actually be used to prevent the corrosion of stainless steel. And then as part of our associate program research work, um, this was under the mentorship of Dr. Rohan Pereira. We actually developed an online learning course as well as an evaluation exam, an examination to test your knowledge on chemical safety and security. And we published this last year. And we actually use this um, as a final exam for my students in the chemical security and safety course. And of course, our most recent publication on nano safety, like I said, this was a result of our nano safety project, which, is, which was the initiative of the DOSC and DPI. And our group is called the Bureau of Philippine Standards Technical Committee 85. And we review ISO standards to see if it can be adopted as Philippine standards and then perform experiments on metrology and equipment calibration for nanotechnology to help the different stakeholders, especially the industry. And this paper has been accepted um, very recently. And of course, now I want to talk about the aspiration, the dream of the university. And so before the pandemic, um, this was our first activity, which is our UP CBR and NE's focus group activity, just to discuss what the university can do, what the university can offer for CBR and E. We want to um, work closely with stakeholders and especially the government agencies so we can actually put this together and provide a degree granting um, institute for this type of, of um, for, for CBR and E. But then during the pandemic, nothing really happened. And, but in 2022, finally, we had our most recent activity, which was um, strengthening chemical threat agents, um, analysis and source attribution capabilities in the Philippines. And we did this with the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. It was, a, of course, a wonderful experience for the focus group of the CBRNE, especially the clandestine lab exercises, which I think I can use for my own classes. So you enter a room and you see a clandestine lab and you're supposed to identify what compounds are being synthesized in these labs using your mobile phone as your pretend um, uh, gadgets, uh, small gadgets. And... Um, That ends my presentation. Um, thank you very much. I will be ready for questions when it's time. And um, just a little, a small shout out to my Italian friend, Matteo, I think it was something to do with this. Um, thank you, Dr. Matteo Guidotti. Okay. Thank you very much, Ivy, for showing us how you can perform research and also contribute as a counselor for an organization that works for, for peace. <laughs> now it's time to introduce the next panelists and to have a look at the history of women in science. 
Our next uh, guest is uh, Annette Lickness. She is uh, professor of chemistry education at the Norwegian University of Trondheim and is an historian of uh, chemistry. She will talk with us today on uh, radioactivity for good and bad and the women's role in the field. Please, Annette, the stage is yours. Thank you very much and hello everyone and thank you for the kind invitation. So why talk about radioactivity in an event placing emphasis on women at the forefront of global conflicts? In my view, radioactivity is an interesting field when it comes to understanding women's roles in science and work at the interface of science and society. In fact, radioactivity research attracted an unprecedented number of women researchers in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, let me see. And here you can see some of them. The field offered women opportunities to take part in cutting edge research and cover the nature of the unknown rays, understand the science of the atom and discover new chemical elements. We all know that some of this knowledge was utilized in the development of the atomic bomb. But as we shall see, radioactivity research also found its use in medical products and treatment and women scientists used their expertise to serve wounded during the war. And during this talk, I will mention different aspects of radioactivity research and its fruits in different periods of time. But my emphasis will be on the early period of radioactivity research. That is before World War II. This is the period I know best from my own research. <clears throat> there were in particular two large research institutions to which women flocked in the early 20th century. And as you can see from the numbers, uh, quite a large share of the staff members were women. And there were also women in other laboratories across Europe. Why is that so? Since the late 1990s, scholars have been interested in studying the women in these labs and some master narratives, if I may say, have been developed and circulated. And one of the reasons for the large number of women in the field that has been discussed is the significance of the supportive mentors in these labs. Marie Curie herself never actively worked to attract women to the lab, but the prospect of having a female mentor in a research lab in the early 20th century should not be underestimated. But we also saw that the research institute in Vienna also attracted uh, many women. Um, and one of them was Elisabeth Rolna. And she was one of the women who were mentored by Stefan Meyer, who was a known leader of the laboratory and known to be very welcome towards women. But uh, Rona was also lucky to work with other um, supportive male mentors, among them Casimir Fayans, when she studied at Karlsruhe in Germany. She worked under George de Hevesy in Budapest and Otto Hahn in Berlin. Um, uh, Ernest Rutherford, another uh, famous figure in the history of radioactivity, was also known to welcome women in his laboratory in Canada and England. And he became particularly important for Harriet Brooks, who we will meet shortly. And I will also mention two authorities in atomic weight determinations, Otto Hoenigschmied at Munich and Theodor Richards at Harvard, where some of the women went to learn the technique. And for Ellen Gledish, a Norwegian chemist, uh, working under Richard was a very positive experience compared to the first encounter she had with a science lab in the US, where she was told that no woman had ever set foot in the laboratory. And that was it. Um, other uh, parts of the master narratives are um, the research, research practices, um, that they were very simple and routine-like, but this has been challenged. Uh, and we have also seen emphasis on local factors. For example, historian of science, Maria Rantetsi, who has studied the Radium Institute in Vienna, who have emphasized the political and cultural context that promoted women's presence. And I will mention one last thing, 
that radioactivity was a new field with no established male hierarchies that could hinder women from finding a place and becoming part of a research milieu. Uh, and since the research was in its initial phase, uh, it might also have attracted students who were ambitious, who dreamed of taking part in something new or making discoveries and being included in a stimulating and creative environment. And also who were willing to take the risk that this research did not turn into anything big at all. So who were these women and what characterized the research that they took part in? I will give you a couple of examples so you get an impression of what it was uh, like. Uh, so this is Harriet Brooks. She was Canadian. She was the first graduate student of Ernest Rutherford at McGill University already in 1898. And she was also the first female student to arrive in Marie Curie's laboratory in 1906. And we mentioned earlier that Rutherford was an important mentor for her. Uh, so she started working with him the same year as Marie and Pierre Curie had discovered polonium uh, and radium based on their particular radioactivity. But apart from that, very little was known about what radioactivity actually was. And there were some discoveries um, or observations that um, the two known naturally occurring elements that were radioactive, uranium and thorium, emitted something that would make the surroundings radioactive. And I show you here a scheme of uh, radioactive decay that is from a few years after this, but I show it to give you an impression of how the scientists were trying to map or figure out what was actually going on during radioactive processes. So what I mentioned was that thorium and also radium uh, emitted something during radioactive uh, process that would make uh, the air around it conduct electricity and therefore made it radioactive. So Rutherford decided to study what this uh, emanation was and in particular the radium emanation. And he, uh, took with him his student, his graduate student, Harriet Brooks, and together they described this radium emanation as a gas of high molecular weight that was distinguished from radium itself. So implicitly they indicated that this was a new element. And some years later, it was identified as the gas we now call radon. But even more importantly than <clears throat> the discovery of the element itself was that these observations uh, made uh, or were become important for Rutherford and his colleague Frederick Soddy uh, when they were going to propose a theory for what radioactivity actually was. So they uh, called it the theory of radioactive disintegration and they ascribed the property to uh, the atom. So whenever thorium atoms, for example, underwent uh, radioactivity or gave off rays, they would also produce atoms of a different kind of element, for example, radon. <clears throat> so the second woman I wanted to uh, tell you about, that was also the second woman to arrive in Marie Curie's laboratory in 1907. That was the Norwegian chemist and pharmacist Ellen Gledich. She was fortunate to be accepted as co-worker number 11 in an otherwise cramped laboratory because she had expertise that Marie Curie needed. She knew how to analyze minerals and that was very important to prepare radioactive uh, samples. And I show you this scheme of radioactive decay again because uh, Many of the researchers in that period were trying to solve some of these puzzles and try to figure out how they were linked. So we see here that there are pieces of information that were known that uranium would decay into, into some products, that radium would decay into some products, but Gledich set out to, to establish that there was a connection between these two, that in fact uranium was the mother substance of radium. <clears throat> And establishing relationships between radio elements, determining their half-lives as well as their atomic weights were typical problems in the first two decades of the 20th century. It was important to settle such fundamental knowledge in the field. 
But the field was so successful that at the end of the 1920s, it had reached a saturation point. And the historian of science, Lawrence Badasht, calls it the suicidal success of radioactivity. Because it had reached what it set out to do, the disintegration theory, the theory that Rutherford and Soddy put forward as an explanation of what radioactivity was, had been accepted. The concept of isotopes that had been introduced in 1913 had been accepted and explained some uh, difficulties that uh, they had in the beginning. And most radio elements had been identified and located in their decay change. As we can see here, starting from radioactive uranium, disintegrating through several steps until uh, they reached a stable lead isotope. So actually people didn't expect much more from the field. But history shows that in the 1930s, the situation changed. The discovery of the neutron by the English physicist James Chadwick in 1932 and artificial radioactivity by Marie Curie's daughter Irene Joliot Curie and her husband Frédéric Joliot Curie in 1934 opened up a completely new avenue for research which de developed into nuclear chemistry and physics. And the range of experience, experiments were carried out uh, in different laboratories to study the phenomenon of artificial radioactivity further. So scientists bombarded nuclei of uranium, uh, um, for example, by um, they bombarded them with neutrons and other particles to study what happened. And eventually this enabled the discovery of nuclear fission during winter 1938-39 by Lisa Meitner, Otto Hahn, Otto Frisch and Fritz Strassmann. And we all know that this discovery made the idea of nuclear weapons possible. And also in this endeavor, women scientists played important roles. <clears throat> I am of course referring to the Manhattan Project, America's secret project to develop the first nuclear weapons. And this is an early example of what has been coined the big science project, large scale scientific technological projects with enormous budgets and involving large teams. In fact, because men were drafted, hundreds of women worked in the project as scientists, mathematicians, engineers and technicians. The most famous of the women uh, that took part in this project is perhaps Maria Gupper Meyer, who in 1963 was awarded a share of the Nobel Prize in Physics for her discovery of nuclear shell structure. Elizabeth Rona, who we have also mentioned, became an expert on preparing polonium samples and was recruited to work for the US Atomic Energy Commission after the war on projects related to isotope separation. But in the following, <clears throat> I will present one of the scientists recruited to the Manhattan Project, namely Jian Xiu Wu. Wu. And I lean here on the fine account uh, written about Wu by Anne Robinson. So Wu is often referred to as the Chinese Marie Curie and the first lady of physics. She did her bachelor's degree at the University of Nanjing and traveled to California in 1936 to pursue graduate studies in physics. And there Ernest O. Lawrence became her supervisor. He would later win the Nobel Prize in Physics for the development of the cyclotron. And part of her doctoral work, which was completed in 1940, was to investigate fission products of uranium. So she extracted iodine, which had been produced when uranium atoms had been bombarded with neutrons. And from this iodine, she found two isotopes of xenon, xenon-133 and xenon-135. Knowledge about the latter turned out to be critical to the Manhattan Project because it had an impact on the production of plutonium, which was considered promising in the development of nuclear weapons because xenon-135 turned out to have an affinity for absorbing a large number of neutrons, which made it shut down the chain reaction uh, and uh, stop the reactor. So for this reason, reason, it was considered a nuclear poison. 
actually, uh, the failure to account for this buildup of uh, xenon has been described as a contributing factor for the meltdown on the Chernobyl reactor in 1986. So Wu's work not only contributed important expertise to solve a major problem during the Manhattan Project, her knowledge also informed the building and operating of future nuclear reactors. And she later became professor at Columbia University and contributed to the theory of subatomic behavior known as weak interaction. But women in radioactivity also contributed to doing good during the war. <clears throat> A well-known case is Marie Curie and her efforts in radiology services during World War I. She wanted immediately to make herself useful and knew that X-rays uh, was very important to localize fragments of metal inside the body to help surgeons who were going to remove it. But she also realized that this equipment was very scarce and also there was a lack of electricity in hospitals to run it and there was also lack of trained personnel. So uh, she decided to set up a mobile uh, radiology unit that is a car that was big enough to carry both the electricity and the x-ray equipment. And here we can see her uh, driving one of the cars because she also took the driver's license and was able to help that way also. You may wonder why uh, she was working on x-rays. It's not radioactivity, but the, the phenomena were related in the very beginning. And it has been said that everybody working in radioactivity in that early period knew how to operate x-rays. <clears throat> so during the war, she equipped 18 mobile cars and established about 200 permanent radiology posts, of course, with the help and funding from, from willing people, but also with some resistance. She also trained uh, 150 female technicians and her daughter, Irene Curie, who we can see in the left picture, she was only 17 at the time. She insisted to join the effort and took part uh, during the war. <clears throat> but services to the wounded was not the only way that radioactivity was used doing good for society. Radium was also used for therapeutic purposes. One example is the spa bath, which was a very popular general treatment already in the 19th century, but with radioactivity added, it was uh, even more popular. Um, there were also a lot of health product flourishing here exemplified by toilet requisites. And you may wonder, this is just Quakery, this is not science. But in fact, the distinction was not very clear. Products were sold alongside medical products and some scientists also acted as consultants uh, for some of the products. And Ellen Gledich herself made a personal radium cloth for her brother who had very, um, who, his, whose shoulders hurt. Um, <clears throat> and Elizabeth Rona, who we have heard about, worked for a few years at a radium cancer hospital in Budapest to prepare radium for medicinal purposes. And she also studied the use of polonium in leukemia therapy. In her book about radiology service during the war, Marie Curie dedicated one full chapter to radium therapy. And here she explained that only a few hundred of grams of radium sufficed for radium treatment. And this might seem very easy to get hold of this small amount, but the fact is that to get 100 of gram of radium, you need tons of minerals and uh, a very uh, long time and a lot of work. Uh, so it was important. So that's why that's why radium was so expensive because of the amount of work to produce it. That's why it was important to find other alternatives. And Marie Curie established a radium emanation service at her institute. You may remember I mentioned Harriet Brooks and her work on the radium emanation with Rutherford. So since radium continuously produces this radium emanation or radon gas, 
this could be utilized for medicinal purposes. So you didn't need to produce new radium, you just extracted all the time the, the emanation that was produced, put them in sealed bottles and transported them to military and civil hospitals <clears throat> during the war. So <clears throat> getting to uh, the end of the talk, we have seen that radioactivity uh, was uh, delivering new knowledge, developing expertise. We saw that applications were both for good and bad, and that the field developed into uh, more uh, advanced, instrumental and uh, large-scale uh, fields uh, at the intersection of many areas. But what, what else can the, the field offer in terms of, uh, of war efforts? I would like to emphasize the networking aspect of radioactivity as a research field, because there were women spread across Europe in many laboratories. When they had been to the big laboratories, they went to other ones, they went to their home universities. Of course, that was a huge encouragement to the women themselves, who didn't, in many cases, didn't have other female colleagues. But it was also uh, important for the exchange of materials for research and medical purposes. Uh, for example, Ellen Gledisch provided mineral samples to many countries for research. And when the University Hospital in Oslo needed the first decigram of radium to start medical treatment, she got a very good price and she could provide the first sample to, to Norway. During the war, the female uh, researchers also helped each other find, find shelter, especially the Jews that had to flee. So in many ways, this network was a very important uh, part of the, <clears throat> the field. But I would like to emphasize, emphasize the international aspect even more. In Gledic's time, for example, when she was in Marie Curie's laboratory, in one single year, as much as 17 different countries were represented. And this is how Gledisch describes working in such an environment in 1932. You return from such a stay abroad, greatly enriched, not exactly in gold, but in noble goods. An understanding of your science, knowledge of another country's people and culture, and an extended acquaintance with representatives of still many other countries and people. And exactly this was the idea of broadening women's uh, perspectives uh, to avoid another catastrophe like the World War I was the aim of the establishment of the International Federation of University Women, which is now called the Graduate Women International, and for which Ellen Gledisch became uh, president. So she worked for establishing fellowships so women could travel, therefore get to know each other. And as she said, you will pass from bewilderment to budding understanding and from understanding to respect and love. So in terms of applications, we might say that radioactivity has served both good and bad. But the narrative we choose depends on the perspective. If we choose to see it in light of women's roles in science, which is the reason for a celebration today, radioactivity was one of the fields making room for women, not just to enter scientific research, but to grow and to contribute, both in terms of producing knowledge, of serving the community, and with respect to using the power of women's network to serve the good. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much, Annette, for your work and for your encouragement for all the women to work for good as a chemist. And uh, our panelists are finished. The section now uh, is going through the uh, questions. And so I will uh, call Pilar Goya, who will coordinate the questions that are already arrived and still are arriving. And thank you very much to all the panelists for the, uh, their presence and for showing us how uh, power, uh, powerful can be the chemist and how women can work in chemistry for strong uh, 
uh, courses. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please, okay. Pilar, the, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you to all the, the panelists. Now we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, when you um, registered, we were you were given the possibility to provide us with questions. So we got quite a number, but of course we had to, to do a selection. So we, in principle, we have chosen these three. And I think the first one is, is interesting in, the, in this context of what we are doing today. And it's probably uh, referred, or should I me answer it, how hard is it for women to get positions in international organizations like OPCW and how are they accepted? Uh, so perhaps I mean, if you would like to deal with yes. this. Thank you, Pilar, for that question. I just want to put my answer in context. Of course, this is based on my experience as member of the SAB. So, so far in the Philippines, we've had three SAB members. The first one was male, but the last two members are females. And I think this speaks, tells us that these tells us in a way that, you know, the application process is the same for all, for all gender. So you can be a man or a woman and um, you still have the chance to actually um, apply to the OPCW. So in terms of the number of women, though, in the OPCW sub, there are seven out of 25. And I think this is reflective, really, of the number of women that we have in science. So around 30 percent, if I may say that. And of course, we can improve on this. And as an organization, OPCW, of course, is for inclusivity, not only in terms of gender, but, but also in terms of culture, as well as your background um, as a scientist. So that's important. You have to have diverse background. And I think all of you will agree on this, that um, diversity actually leads to a better decision making, as well as a more creative way of solving problems. Thank you, Pilar. Thank you. Uh, any one of the panelists would like to add something on on this first question? P yes. Pilar, if I may, yes. um, sorry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that to, to Imi's, um comment, actually, because um, certainly in my world of the designated laboratories within the OPCW, um, I know uh, four very influential um, women leaders that have held um, very influential roles. So um, currently, just, and that's also been um, diverse in terms of its global demographic. So we've had um, Paula Vanenen that sat on um, the Scientific Advisory Board, um, and she's um, from Finland. Um, Ho Chi, who has been head of the OPCW Laboratory, um, in, and she's from Singapore. Um, Veronica Brown, who's the, the Director for Verification from the UK, currently at the OPCW. Um, and Jenny and Jenny Nylon, um, who has been a senior analytical chemist um, from Sweden. So, in my um, uh, from my perspective, I guess um, I, I see these these women as really influential leaders um, in positions um, entrusted within the OPCW for that designated laboratory network, um, and also showing um, the, the evidence that we're building these skills among women across the world. Um, to enable them to to both apply and be successfully appointed um, at this progressive organisation that the OCW is in terms of demonstrating and and um, wanting that that uh, inclusive and diverse nature of its its uh, its people. Um, so I just wanted to add that because I think there's some great um, women role models out there. Uh, thank you, thank you, Sarah. Uh, well, I, I think uh, this links very well with uh, the, the lecture of Anete, in which we have seen how women particularly contributed to radioactivity. But I think the role of women, that, that's, uh, that's in, uh, historically, but from what both of you have said, uh, I, me and, and, and Sarah, it means that women still have a role in this kind of uh, organizations and and in trying to, to use positively the, the, the chemicals. And I think in a way, uh, both of you have already dealt uh, with inclusion and diversity because we have, uh, I mean, in particular, you've not only spoken about uh, gender, but also about uh, inclusion and diversity. So I don't know if uh, you consider that the second question is also answered or would you like to add any other thing on, on this topic? Okay, then we will move to a, a third question, 
which is more related to education, and it's uh, how should chemical education prepare secondary school students for the uh, ethical use and misuse of chemicals? Uh, I mean, should we uh, do something to foster these, uh, these dilemmas or to, to help the students solve this dilemma? Maybe, Annette, you could like to comment on this? Yes. <clears throat> Of course, this is important uh, and important aspects of, of uh, science education to to uh, discuss these aspects related to the societal use of, of chemicals and and I I, I am thinking about this uh, this trend that we see uh, with um, aspects in science related to uh, democracy and citizenship that this is emphasized more than before that you should be prepared to take part in discussions in society. Uh, you should recognize arguments that are scientific and non-scientific. You should also make your own arguments, take part. So I think it fits very well in within that um, way of thinking that we see, at least in the Norwegian curriculum and also internationally. And I was also thinking about the historical approach that I am very much in favor of, of course, uh, because we see how uh, science can lead to ethical dilemma and misuse of um, or, or how the consequences can be be very bad and uh, using historical cases like nuclear fission and Manhattan Project for example can be discussed uh, and uh, how what was it like to be a woman to to enter this what kind of dilemmas were you faced with and what how what does it mean for us today Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Uh, Aimi or maybe Sarah, would you like to add something? I know, Aimi, you have shown us what you do, not with secondary schools, but what you do with students. So maybe you would like to uh, further elaborate on this or... Yes, um, I think this is important that our students in the secondary level are aware of this particular peaceful use of chemistry ideal, but then we have to study the approach on how we teach them. So I think it's important that we have that balance between sharing information and then also of being very careful of what information to share. So I think it's really a collaborative work between, for example, experts on this particular field, chemical safety and security, for instance, and also the teachers, the secondary school teachers. And um, there has to be that working together to come up with a proper way to introduce to these students this type of um, topics or concepts. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, would you like to add something? I know you have, your, you, you have already talked to us about your personal experience and that you wanted to do this. So maybe you would like to add something? Thank you. I, obviously, my, my background is uh, not in education as such or um, academia. However, we do come across that balance that it may still come talking about in terms of um, ensuring the technical rigor of the science that we do um, within the scientific community. And, and not always is it possible for us to um, publish the work that we do and um, for security reasons. So there is always a delicate balance, but we do have a number of mechanisms um, within certain, certainly international community um, and in um, visiting academics that we can make uh, sure we get that technical rigor reviewed, even if we can't publish it, publish that work. So we have to make sure we're utilizing those mechanisms, but uh, there is a delicate balance because in my view, um, we also want to make sure that from a deterrence perspective, we can publish um, enough of our work to show what capabilities are available to deter chemical weapons use. Um, but of course, um, the, the sensitive information um, must be constantly reviewed and, 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 um, and obviously not be in the public domain um, to, al to allow um, those to fall into the wrong hands. So um, a delicate balance, but I think it's, uh, it's important to ensure a technical rigor through um, strict mechanisms. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, we don't have much time left, but uh, we have uh, received some interesting questions from the audience. What is your uh, position about the everlasting dilemma 
between sharing in science and security issues. Actually, open access data and knowledge is good for scientific development worldwide, but it may pose problems in terms of easy access to critical information by malicious users for criminal purposes. Any one of, of you, I me or Sarah, or, or even um, perhaps Annette, would you like? I, to... I can start with just uh, one reflection. Um, yes. of, I don't have a universal solution. That, that's the first thing. But but in historical perspective, of course, the Manhattan Project was under the to uh, top secrecy uh, for a reason. Uh, and I mean, there are incidences where, where there are good reasons for, for uh, not being open about what is going on. Um, we don't know whether this will happen in the future, a similar situation, but um, yeah, that was just one reflection. Um, from my perspective, of course, as an educator, once again, we have to really walk that tightrope. There has to be a balance between sharing information. So there are a lot of information already out there in the internet, and I think that's okay to talk about it because it's out in the open. And it's important for your students to be aware that this could this information could be misused. But then it's important not to share confidential information or information, of course, that will, will lead to a very drastic or very negative results. So I think you have to be you have to keep that balance. Maybe I'll just take this uh, last question. Uh, so what about disposing and managing the mass produced chemical waste, be it industrially produced or stocks of chemical warfare? Is this also something the OPCW oversees or questions for foundational education for chemistry students? Um, I, I, okay, I can answer this. Okay. Yes, this, uh, this is of course being talked about at OPCW as this is a very important problem. And this has um, very negative environmental implications. And the answer is yes. OK. Uh, Sarah, would you like to add anything? Uh, yes, I, I guess um, on the receiving end, um, in terms of OPCW inspections, um, I can say that certainly the stocks, any stocks of chemical um, warfare agents that um, a member state declares is routinely inspected by the OPCW. Mm -hmm. So that uh, as part of that verification regime, so that is strictly um, monitored and, and reviewed and verified. Um, and as I mentioned, from my uh, perspective as an analytical um, laboratory, um, often they will be sampling analysis to verify any, any question marks um, in that respect. So I, I can certainly comment on that piece. It is part of that governance. Okay, thank you so much. Now I think it's time to, to finish this uh, webinar. It's my great pleasure to close this most interesting session. I have to uh, sincerely thank the panelists, Aimi, Sarah, and Annette, not only for your excellent uh, presentations today, but also for being from the very beginning willing and, and, and ready to participate in this uh, adventure. Of course, I would like to thank the participants. I would also like to thank uh, the Secretariat in Brussels, Nineta, Claudia and Martin, because they have done an excellent job in coordinating this, in making it run smoothly. So without them, none of this would have been possible. And we are also very grateful for our president, for our UCAMS president and UCAMS president-elect, Floris and Angela for having taken part today. And please stay in touch and uh, with UCAMS. And uh, we hope that uh, in the following years, you will again participate in this Global Women's Breakfast, which is after all uh, a, a way of celebrating the role of women and the girl in science. So thank you very much for all of you. And this the webinar is over thank you thank you bye